Welcome back guys, and today's video is going to be devoted to power amplifiers and choosing the right one for your equipment. Now I'm actually going to be devoting a few videos over the course of a few weeks here to power amplifiers, not only taking a look at a few of the ones I recommend, reviewing some as well as purchasing an additional one for myself, but I'm going to be talking about something that in my opinion is one of the most commonly overlooked aspects of a power amplifier and its ability to be driven by the preamplifier that you're using. Let's get started. Okay, so you've made the determination of the distinction between separates and having a separate preamplifier or processor versus an AV receiver and using power amplifiers. With the ever increasing popularity of object based surround sound such as Dolby Atmos and DTSX, it's become increasingly popular for the use of a power amplifier. Since there are so many 9 channel receivers that are on the market today that include 11 channels of processing, it's become popular for people to pick up either a 2 channel power amplifier or a multi channel amp and use that with their existing setup. But something that I don't think people often consider is the preamplifier voltage gain, which essentially considers the amount of power your power amplifier will be putting out. While attempting to make this video as easy to understand for everyone as I could, I found the Audioholics website to be the easiest ex explanation, at least, to try and understand voltage gain. So what exactly is voltage gain? It is basically the degree to which an amplifier actually amplifies the input from the preamplifier or processor not enough voltage gain and your power amplifier won't sound as it should. Too much voltage gain and you might have a noise floor problem or distortion which oftentimes can be found in 60 Hz hum or buzz. I think one of the most common aspects of choosing any power amplifier is simply people take a look at the power output it's capable of, maybe the use of the transformer and how large it is, and often think, well, this power amplifier has 180 or 250 watts RMS each channel, all channels driven, it must be a good power amp. That's not necessarily the case with every one of them. Um, an amplifier has a pretty easy job, and that is to take the incoming voltage signal from the preamplifier or processor, or in most cases an AV receiver nowadays, and make it bigger or amplify it. And obviously the amount by which the incoming signal is amplified is given of course in decibels. But keep in mind, every six decibels of gain actually equates to a doubling of voltage. It just so happens that the THX standard gain level for most power amplifiers is 29 dB. And in fact, most moderately priced home theater or even two channel listening power amplifiers, you're going to find between at least 27 and 30 decibels of gain. So keep in mind that using balanced inputs and outputs decreases the gain to 23 decibels of which it requires. Naturally though, the output of the preamp using XLR balanced connections is boosted by 6 decibels, at least considering this scenario. The voltage output of the preamp is doubled. So when you're using a power amplifier and a preamp that are using RCA connections, you're going to want to look for around a 29 decibel amount of gain, guys. So oftentimes matching these numbers up can equal a great sounding system, and having odd numbers that don't exactly match up together nicely equals a poorly sounding surround sound system. For example, using a receiver with poorly implemented preamp outputs can result in a problem when coupled to a high powered amplifier with relatively low voltage gain is going to give you a high input sensitivity. So this is the amount of voltage needed from the preamp to drive the amplifier to full unclipped power. Most power amps on the market today are usually going to be around 1 to 2 volts RMS. So let's say you've got a surround sound receiver receiver that is only capable of delivering 1 volt root mean squared from its preamplifier outputs before clipping. Remember, this is totally different than connecting the speakers directly to the receiver or from the power amplifier. 
Now, if it's delivering one volt RMS from its preamp outputs before clipping, and you pair this receiver with a high-powered amplifier expecting, well, a large boost in headroom or volume capability, you're going to be sorely disappointed if the voltage gain is below the average 27 decibels. Obviously, there's a huge difference between the pure sine wave and, in this case, the clipped sine wave. So even if you buy a $10,000 power amp that's rated at 1,000 watts per channel at 8 ohms, but you're driving it with very low voltage gain from the preamplifier, all you're going to be doing when you turn the volume up is adding distortion, clipping the signal, or potentially tripping the protection circuits in the power amplifier. So in the long run, what all this means is that if you've got an AV receiver with a little bit less power than you were hoping for, and you bought a power amplifier expecting that it would make incredible sound quality difference, well, the voltage gain is definitely something that you're going to want to look at in the power amplifier, and the preamp voltage gain is something you definitely want to take a look at in your AV receiver or pre-pro processor. Here are the equations needed to figure out how much voltage gain you need from your preamplifier to determine how much power you will be getting from your power amplifier. Okay, but what does this all mean? So if we use Audioholics equation to kind of figure this out, we'll see that they came to 50 watts root mean squared into an 8 ohm load means the amplifier is delivering 20 volts at full power. All you need to do then is divide the amount of gain that the amplifier is providing, which in most cases is going to be anywhere from 27 to 30 dB. So this is obviously going to depend on the particular preamplifier or AV receiver you have, as well as the power amplifier you're looking at. But in this mathematical equation at least, if the amplifier rated to deliver 20 volts root mean squared is amplifying the input signal by a factor of 25.1, we can say that the preamplifier needs to deliver no less than 0.797 volts root mean squared to drive our amplifier to full power. But wait guys, before you start looking for power amplifiers with higher than average gain, consider this. A very high level of gain leads to its own issues, really ultimately noise. Remember guys, as the voltage from the preamplifier output goes down, the signal will get closer to the noise floor of the system. Get too close with a higher sensitivity speaker, given the fact that ultimately they need less output from the amplifier to begin with, and you're going to understand what crappy or garbage noise sounds like. An increase in amplifier gain will ultimately decrease in the bandwidth of the circuit and having a high gain amplifier may introduce DC offset at the output. So, in an amplifier with a high input impedance, essentially you're increasing the gain that introduces DC offset, which ultimately affects the operating point of the circuit and changes the balance of the amplifier, ultimately giving you distortion or bad sound. So guys, carefully looking at the voltage gain your preamplifier is capable of putting out, along with the voltage gain or the gain of the power amplifier, that's going to determine ultimately how your system is going to sound. So some of the low-end receivers might really not be the best pieces of equipment for adding separate power amplifiers, while some of the receivers can actually be amazing, um, particularly the Yamaha RX A. 1010 Advantage or Avantage was recently bench tested by Audioholics to deliver 2.8 volts root mean squared from its preouts, which is an adequate amount to you know basically drive any external amplifier within reason.